morning. Good to see you here this morning. If you take your hymn book and turn to hymn number 153, How Firm a Foundation, let's stand and we'll sing that second verse together. Brother Bob's come to lead us. Hymn number 153. <clears throat> <clears throat> standing for morning prayer. Well, amen. It's good to see you here. God bless you for being here this morning. We're looking forward to what the Lord has for us in this hour. I trust you'll pray with me as I pray in just a moment that God would bless in every part of this meeting, the singing, the giving, the preaching, that he would get great glory and honor from everything that's said and done. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the privilege we have to be in your house this morning. Thank you for, uh, Lord, allowing us the safety to be here and the health and strength to be here. Now, Lord, I pray as we enter into this service, we thank you for what we just sang, the truth of that hymn. And Lord, we know that we have a wonderful, firm foundation in you, that nothing can shake it. Even as that verse said, uh, Lord, even concerning the gates of hell, they cannot, they cannot move the foundation that we have in thee. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray as we enter into this service that you would, uh, you would guide and direct, Lord, help us to be sensitive to the leading of your spirit uh, speak to hearts. Uh, Lord, I pray as the word of God is preached that you would, uh, Lord, work in each and every heart that's here. It's no accident that you've brought here who you've brought here for this hour. And I pray that you do a great work. If there would be one among us, whether they be in this auditorium, whether they be in other parts of the building with the junior churches that are meeting, that does not know you as Savior, I pray that today would be the day they would trust you and have assurance as they leave here that heaven is their home, that Jesus Christ is their Savior. Lord, I pray for every Christian that's here today. May we, uh, Lord, may you speak to our hearts. May we be encouraged and strengthened, helped. Uh, Lord, rebuke us and correct us where necessary and help us just to be open and responsive to your word. Guide and direct in every part of this meeting, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Take your hymnals once again, please, and turn to hymn number 324, Draw Me Nearer. And would you stand, please, everyone, together, let us sing all four verses of hymn number 324. coming this way. If you're visiting with us today, God bless you for being here. And these men want to put a packet of information in your hand. If you'll raise your hand as they make their way back to you, there's a card on the inside. If you'd fill it out, leave it with us in the offering plate. In just a moment, we'll have a record of your visit. And God bless you for being here today at Calvary Independent Baptist Church. If you have a bulletin in hand, if you'd take it out and look at it with me for just a few moments, some things we want to make special note of. While you're doing that, let me remind you there's a Nice thank you note out here from uh, the Gormans uh, for all the visits and calls and cards and different things. And I'll lay that out on the table. You can read that at your leisure. And a nice picture that Brother Nunez and Gwendolyn sent us from uh, down in Mexico and the ministry there. And the young man that's pictured here is the one that's going to be starting a church. And uh, so I'll lay that out there and you can read that card and look at that picture at your leisure as well. And then there's a new Sword of the Lord available as well, and I encourage you to pick that up uh, as you exit uh, this morning. Now, if you look at the bulletin, a couple of things that I want to remind you of. Senior Saints will be a trip that's planned for this Friday, and uh, leaving at 9.30, returning at 2, going to eat at Hosses for lunch, up to Elizabethtown College for this exhibit, Manifold Greatness, the Creation of Afterlife, the King James Bible. If you haven't signed up for that, let me encourage you to do so. Also, there's a sign-up sheet out there for the Valentine's Banquet. You see the cost. You see the menu given for you here as well. And we really need you to sign up today. If you're planning on coming and you haven't signed up already, 
and we need to get that order in so we can have everything here and prepared and ready to go on Saturday. So if you can make sure we need that, we'll take that up after today. It won't be out there on Wednesday evening. So let me encourage you to sign up if you're planning on being with us. Our Father and Son Retreat is coming up and in a little over a month, and we're looking forward to this. And uh, I'm excited about Brother Roger Pauley and his son Scott Pauley being here with us. And uh, Brother Roger is the pastor down at the Cranberry Baptist Church in Beckley, West Virginia. And Brother Scott is the vice president of Crown College in uh, Powell, Tennessee. And so they're going to be with us on the Lord's Day as well. But I want to encourage you men, and all of our men, we give you a, a price break from what we have other churches. And we want you to come. If you don't want to spend the night, then come over on Saturday and join us for the day. Ten dollars, you get all your food included in that, and you'll, there'll be plenty to eat. Make no mistake about that. If you don't have a father, if you don't have a son in the area, or they're lost, or whatever the case, look, this is still for you. You come, we'll have a great time. And uh, we're trying to get other churches encouraged and involved in that as well, of like faith and practice, of course. And we're looking forward to that and asking God to bless in a great way. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet out there to sign up for that. This evening we'll have our uh, King's Kids Awards. Let me remind you concerning that, that's not in there, but we got them in, and so we'll have those awards this evening. And the board members, let me remind you, next uh, Sunday afternoon we'll have our board meeting, 415. Our monthly fellowship will be on the 24th, and then our ministry at the Presbyterian Retirement Community on the 20th. Six. Their missionary birthday and anniversary cards are out there in the lobby. Let me encourage you to sign those if you haven't done so already. And also out on the foyer table, this table right here on the right-hand side as you go out the doors, uh, there is a list of things that Fred Zimmerman's daughter asked me to uh, put out for you in case you might want some things. Most of it's furnishings, furniture, and they'll be selling Fred's uh, home that he lived in. Uh, over in New Providence, and that's on there too as well, if you know someone who's interested in that. And uh, you might want to stop by there and look at that. And uh, I don't know that we put her number out there, but we can make sure you get her number if you're interested in that. And you can call her about that. She's trying to, uh, uh, to move those things, and so that'd be a great help. If you look on the list here, some health needs, some folks that we're praying for. Just remember these folks in prayer. It was good to see uh, Bonnie here today. Uh, glad that she's here with us. Be praying for Deb Zimmerman. She's getting over her surgery as well, and things went well on that, and we praise the Lord for it. And remember uh, Nidra and her recovery, and Rick Draper as well. He's been ill. And also, you might want to add to that list uh, there, uh, one of our young people in our school, Daniel Wright, his mother asked us to pray for him, and he's been ill over the last few days, and uh, not certain exactly what's happening there with him, but do be praying for him. And then uh, Cindy did not, was not able to get her flight uh, yesterday. Probably had something to do with the uh, tremendous amount of snow that was in the northeast. And, uh, but she had to fly out early this morning to Illinois. And uh, so do be praying for her as far as that goes. Or excuse me, back here from Illinois. And uh, so do be praying uh, for her as she continues those treatments. Norma Hyde is the shut of the week, and her address and information is given for you there. And you see we have a birthday coming up here for Mrs. Kelly, and uh, that's tomorrow. Maybe you want to send her a note or a call her. I know that'd be an encouragement to her. Our mystery of the week, we read the letter in the Sunday school hour, are the Davises serving out in Alberta, Hinton, Alberta, Canada, and to be praying for them and their family and the ministry there at the Hinton Baptist Church, and then opportunities throughout the week, of course, this evening, choir at 545, the service at 630. I encourage you to be here and be a part of that. We're going to sing a little chorus together, chorus number 11, send a great revival in my soul, send a great revival in my soul, let the Holy Spirit come and take control, and send a great revival in my soul. Let's stand and we'll sing it together. It's chorus number 11 there in your chorus book. <clears throat> Send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Let the Holy Spirit come and take control. And send a great revival in my soul. Very good. Wendy's going to play it through a little bit there. Greet some of their next two. Tell me you're glad to see them here this morning.
Very good. As you make your way back, let's sing it again one more time. Send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Let the Holy Spirit come and take control and send a great revival in my soul. Very good. As you find your way back, our men are coming this way. We'll receive our offering and trust you'll give and give faithfully. And we praise the Lord for his goodness to us and his faithfulness to us. And we want to give back faithfully to him. And he's promised to take it and multiply it and use it in a great and mighty way. <clears throat> we can testify, I believe we can, as David, that we've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. And we thank God for that. Praise the Lord for it. Brother Bill Johnson, happy anniversary to you and Ruth Ann. I'm sorry I couldn't get here yesterday, but I trust you had a good day and everything went well. Were you surprised? Good, good. Well, that's great. That's great. <laughs> very, very good. Would you lead us in our prayer, please, sir? <clears throat> Amen. Himmels, once again, please turn to hymn number 310, Footprints of Jesus. And would you stand, please, everyone, together, let us sing all four verses of hymn number 310. <clears throat> Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow. of Jesus that makes the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where e'er they go. 
go Though they lead o'er the cold dark mountain Seeking his sheep Or along by Shalom's fountain Helping the weak Footprints of Jesus That make the pathway glow If they lead through the temple, holy preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lowly serving the Lord, footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps. Of Jesus, where there they go. Then at last, when on high he sees us, our journey done, we will rest where the steps of Jesus and at his throne. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow we will follow the steps of Jesus where there they go thank you and please be seated well amen very good if you'll take God's word and turn to the book of Hebrews in the 11th chapter the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and once you've found your place there if you'll also turn to the book of Genesis the book of Genesis in the 6th chapter, Genesis chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 11. We've been going through this 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and these examples of faith. And we come to yet another example that's given for us in the 7th verse, Hebrews chapter 11. Verse number 7 we had faith described for us in the opening verses. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In verse number 7, the writer pens these words, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. We find those two words book in this verse by faith. And this morning, if you want to give a title to the message, it'd just simply be this by faith, Noah. By faith, Noah. In James chapter 2, verse 20, and then again it's repeated in verse number 26, James writes these words Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. A true faith always has works to support its claim, to testify of its genuineness. In other words, there ought to be something that is occurring in your life that's supporting your claim of faith in Jesus Christ. Something there to testify that it is a genuine faith in God. You know, the Bible has always taught everywhere from the beginning that there's only one way to God, and that is by faith. It's always taught that all throughout the scriptures. And the genuineness of my faith and the genuineness of your faith that we proclaim out of our mouth is established in the eyes of those that are looking around us, in the eyes of this world, by what we live out on a daily basis. The Apostle Paul put it this way, if any man be in Christ, he is, definitively, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Faith has always been the only way to God. Uh, the people that we find that are illustrations here in the Old Testament believe God. Remember, we started with Abel in verse number 4. And the Bible says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which, by that sacrifice, he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying 
of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. He, he testifies of that entrance into the life of faith, the beginning. Then we looked at Enoch in verses 5 and 6, and we find out that Enoch spoke to us of the walk of faith. Remember, he walked with God. He pleased God. It was the tenor of his life that he was in constant communion uh, with God. He continued. And now we look at this man, Noah. And Noah is a testament to the work of faith. The work of faith. Noah says, I, just like Abel and just like Enoch, I believe God. I believe God. And then what does he do? He goes, he sets about to prove that he believes God. To reveal to the rest of the world uh, when everyone else want to reject, Noah said, I'm going to tell you, I believe God. And his life preached a great sermon. His faith was not dead because his faith had works. He lived it out on a daily basis there. And you know, sometimes people, uh, they have a beginning, and it looks good for a little while, uh, uh, but somewhere along the line, something tails off. How many people begin with the Lord, continue with the Lord, and work for the Lord? A lot of people make professions, don't they? And we call it a profession of faith. But how can we know that that faith is genuine? We see it lived out. We, we see it exercised in how they live and how they work for the Lord. We know that salvation is not by works, but we have been saved unto good works, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Noah believed God to the point think about it now, he believed God to the point that what he did was very irrational to the world around him. As a matter of fact, many in Noah's day no doubt thought that Noah was insane. They thought that he was some kind of a kook that lost, he, he lost his mind. He was off his rocker. But the fact of the matter is that we find three proofs in this one verse, in Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 7, of the genuineness of Noah's faith, and may they also be testimonies in our lives, those of us who say we know Jesus Christ as Savior, may they be testimonies in our lives of the genuineness of our faith. I want you to think about the very first thing that the Bible mentions here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 7. The Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Let me tell you something that is a testimony of the genuineness of your faith. It is a testimony when you respond in obedience, number one, when you respond in obedience to God's Word. When you respond in obedience to God's Word. God said to Noah, He said, Noah, I want you to understand something. Judgment is coming. It's, it's assured. God looked over that world and He said, uh, the fact of the matter is they're wicked. Everyone is doing after the evil imagination of their own heart. I'm going to destroy this world which I've created. Noah, I want you to know something. Judgment is coming. I'm going to destroy this world with a flood. You need to build an ark. What do we find that Noah did? By the way, don't think Noah wasn't any more busier than you and I are. Don't think that Noah didn't have all the other things to do in life that you and I have to do. But Noah did this. Noah dropped everything. Miles and miles and miles away from an ocean. And he began to build this ark. His whole life was one continual, concentrated preparation for what God had asked him to do. When you think about the testimony of his faith. By the way, you know something? It's no different for you and I. The choice is the same for you and I. In other words, we may live as if the message of God is of little value, or we may live as if the message of God is the most important thing in this world. How will we live? How will we live? Noah said, I tell you how I'm going to live. I believe God. And he went and found his axe and began to go to work on those gopher trees to cut them down to make that ark. When everybody else thought that he was absolutely insane, that he was crazy. You know, a lot of people run out and they start, boy, I mean, they start and it seems like they are, they're head over heels for God when they start. I mean, they're just, you, you, you can't give them enough to do, they can't do enough for the Lord. But then sometimes it never gets much past that. But one thing we see about Noah's faith, it didn't waver, he continued. He was faithful. For over a hundred years, he was faithful. He was faithful to God. Back in 
Hebrews 11, verse 1, the Bible says there that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And notice what it says again in verse 7, that Noah being warned of God of things what? Not seen as yet. That's faith. He had not seen it. He didn't see any water coming from the sky. Uh, someone has said the Lord didn't rain on Noah a little bit one afternoon so he'd get an idea of what he was talking about. It didn't work that way at all. He had no idea of what was going on. But the Bible says he moved with fear. That didn't mean he was over in the corner shaking. That doesn't mean it was fright. That's not what fear it is. You know what that fear is? That fear is that God uh, meant so much to Noah. Noah reverenced God. He revered God and what God said so much that he said, yes, God, I'll drop everything I'm doing and do what you've asked me to do. I'll be obedient to you and do what you've asked me to do. The fact of the matter is, the Bible says in the New Testament that God commands all men everywhere to what? Repent. Some believe that, and they repent. Some people don't believe that. Noah believed God's word. God says to the Christian today, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. And some Christians believe that, and some don't. Some don't. Say, so how do you know they don't? They never act upon it. They never act upon it. Our believing is in direct proportion, in direct proportion to our obedience to what God has commanded us to do. Think about that in Noah's case. And by the way, God honored Noah's faith. He honored Noah's faith, the Bible says in verse 7 here, to the saving of his house. Someone has said one of the greatest acts of faith in the history of the world is when Noah went up and picked up his axe and began to swing it at that first gopher tree. To say that I believe God against, against everything that is rational. I believe God. I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. If you found your place there in verse number 3, the Bible says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and agreed him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. I like verse 8, though. It begins with a conjunction. But, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm glad that you and I have that same grace extended to us. Grace from the Lord. The Bible says in verse number 9, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah, notice, walked with God. Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is, the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then he says, here's his command, verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. That word pitch, interesting. Very interesting word. The word, the Hebrew word there for pitch is the same Hebrew word where we get our English word atonement. Atonement. You say, what's so significant about that preacher? Well, look over with me, if you would, in Leviticus chapter 17 for just a minute. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11. Leviticus 17, 11, the Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. You remember they used to bleed people years and years ago, thought that would help cure things, right? They'd put leeches on them and bleed them. So you're getting grotesque, Pastor. I'm just talking about history a little bit. I'm not trying to be grotesque. You know something, though? If they just read the Bible, they'd realize, eh, it's not a good idea. Not a good idea. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement, there's that word, for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. You say, what's the significance? The significance is this, that, that that word pitch, that word atonement, they can be interchanged there, as a matter of fact. Think about the ark for just a minute. The ark was safety. 
I remember a man that was a member of my father's church, faithful man, loved the Lord, was a blessing and a help and encouragement to my father and the church family, and he'd do just about anything. And I can remember as a boy, I can remember him, he was an usher, and he'd come and he'd pray. And I remember just about every prayer he'd pray, he'd always say this, he'd always say, Lord, save those that are out of the ark of safety. He'd say that just about every time. That rings, that still resonates in my mind from years ago, he'd say that. You know what, his prayer is right. The ark, the ark is a picture of safety, safety from the judgment of God. And what is it that sealed, what is it that sealed that ark? That pitch. That pitch kept the water out of the ark. Hey, here's, here's a beautiful picture. The beautiful picture is that you and I are sealed. We're secure in Christ. Why? Through his blood that was shed. Through the atonement that he made. Well, what a beautiful picture of that pitch that God told Noah to use there on that ark. By the way, God gave Noah a blueprint for the ark. Look with me, if you would, there. Continuing in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 15, God said to Noah, And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Now, you and I don't measure things in cubits anymore. Let me give you just a little bit of English measurements of the size of the ark. It was about 437 and a half feet long. It was nearly 73 feet wide and about four stories high. It had three decks. The total deck area was about 95,700 square feet. And now that, just to help you in your thinking, that's, a, that's more than 20 standard basketball courts. That's how big it was. Uh, the volume of the ark, the cubic feet of the ark, was 1,396,000 cubic feet in the ark. Uh, so the size of it puts it well in comparison with our, our, our ocean liners, large steel ocean going vessels of, of our modern world. Uh, a lecture that was given by a naval admiral to other admirals at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, uh, he said this, uh, very interesting, he said, for centuries men built ships in various proportions, but since British naval machinists found the formula for the battleship Dreadnought, all naval construction follows the proportions of dreadnought, since they have been found to be scientifically perfect. Then he said the proportions of dreadnought were exactly the same as the ark. Then he told them this, God knows how to build ships. God knows how to do a lot of things, right? And so he gives the very dimensions there to Noah. Can you imagine, though, Noah, okay, he's, you know, He's, he's, he has, in all likelihood, very little to no knowledge of ships. He didn't live near bodies of water. And God tells him to build this ark. He doesn't tell him to put a sail on it. He doesn't tell him to build a rudder for it. He doesn't give him any way in which to power the ark. Noah had to expressly trust God. Because once he was in the ark, there was no way to control the ark. In Genesis chapter 6, verse number 17, Behold, I, notice what God, God's speaking, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breadth of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. God tells Noah, he says, I want you to know how it's going to happen. It's going to happen by a flood of waters. I'm going to bring a flood of waters. It's going to rain. Now, for you and I, you know, that's a, what we call a no-brainer, right? Well, we know what rain is. We understand that. But Noah has absolutely no idea what rain is. Look in Genesis chapter 2 with me for just a minute. Genesis chapter 2. The Bible says that God watered the earth a different way before the flood, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And God, when the floods came, the Bible says God broke up the, the fountains of the deep. The whole atmosphere of the earth changed uh, when the flood occurred. 
And who in the world was going to expect such a cataclysmic change like that? Noah, I don't think he had any concept in his brain of everything that was going to take place. It rain it just didn't fit into any category in his mind when God told him how he was going to destroy them. Not only that, in all likelihood, it, it seemed very unlikely to know that God would destroy everything and everyone. And God's judgment seemed such a long way off, uh, 120 years, he could have easily rationalized and, 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 and thought people would repent by that time. And, and, and everywhere he went and everywhere he preached, nobody believed. Nobody returned. Nobody repented. Now as a preacher, to see absolutely no response, Sometimes that's difficult from week to week. But I can't imagine 120 years. 120 years. And, you know, after a while, maybe Noah starts blaming himself. Well, you know, maybe it's me. I mean, I've went over this thing time and time. I don't know how I can make it any plainer, and I just don't know what else to do. And here he is. And can you imagine him out there swinging the hammer and building the ark? And everybody that passed by mocking at him and laughing at him and then even thinking in his own mind I mean if all that water does come how in the world is this monster of a thing going to float I just don't understand how it's going to happen especially once I get all these and that's another thing how in the world are all these animals going to get here get all these animals on this thing but the fact of the matter against everything against all of that he obeyed God i tell you one thing, it convicts me to think about Noah's faith and my faith. Because you know why? We get so used to what's going on in our world and we don't, we don't want to think anything irrational, you know. Well, you know, we just got to, you know, I, 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 just want, I don't want to look, I don't want to stick out, I don't want to be different. I don't, you know, I just kind of got to go along and just be what ought to be as a, a, a citizen of this world and not get, you know, I, you know we get too fanatic about the thing. Verse number 18. Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. But with thee, God speaking still, but with thee, he's talking to Noah, will I establish my covenant. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. You know what God's saying? He said, Noah, I want you to know something. You're going to be my man. And listen, Noah, you and I, we're going to go through this together. Well, I'm glad when the problems and the trials and when God asks great things of us, He doesn't expect us to go it alone. He says, I'm going with you. I'll go with you through it, Noah. I'm going to be right there with you. What was the promise, what was the promise based on, by the way? The promise that God gave Noah in verse 18, it was based on what God said, what the Bible says about Noah in verse number 8 of Genesis chapter 6, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a just man, perfect in his generations. He walked with God. See, Noah didn't have any grace in it of himself. Can I tell you, there was nothing special about Noah, but there was something very special about the God that Noah had faith in. The Bible says about Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 21, you know, this is, a, this is the sad part about Noah's life. After he came off the ark, that he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. You see, there wasn't any good thing in Noah. It wasn't about Noah. It was about the God of Noah and the faith that he exercised in the God of Noah. And God extends grace to Noah. The Bible says in verse number 19 of Genesis chapter 6, Of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Now can you imagine the scene? God says that he was going to bring the animals to Noah. Can you imagine? Once it was all ready to go and the animals were going to go in, can you imagine Noah standing at the door? Just waiting. Can you imagine all? Can you just imagine? What an amazing sight it would have been. Here comes these lines, you know. Go on in there, kitty. Go on in, you know. 
don't take my hand off as you go by and all these different types of things. Can you imagine the elephants and all these different types of things going in? You know what would have been an amazing thing? Wouldn't you like to have been there and just see it? Watch them all walk in? No, I didn't have to call. No, I didn't have to learn any duck calls or whistles or barks or snorts or anything like that. They all just came. What an amazing thing. Hey, there's no other way to explain that but God. There's no other way to explain that but God. Someone calculated the ark from just the space inside could hold easily 7,000 species of animals. 7,000 species of animals. There's plenty of room for all the species. God told Noah to bring the food in enough for him and for them. And also the sacrificial animals that were brought in as well. The average size of an animal... Uh, is about the size, this may be hard for you to imagine, but the average size is about the size of a cat. So that requires less than two square feet uh, per animal. There, therefore, then, it's, it's no stretch of the imagination to think that, that God could get them all in there. Now, remember, they're in there for about a year. Think about all the cleanup and everything else that has to be done. And Noah has a command that absolutely staggers the imagination. The Bible says in verse number 22, Notice, thus did Noah, according to all. Hey, look, it was complete obedience. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him. And then it repeats it for us. So did he. Complete confidence, complete trust, absolute obedience. You know, that command staggers our imagination. It really does. It staggers my imagination to think about it. But think about this. Today, God comes to men and women and boys and girls, and he simply says this, put your faith and trust in my son, Jesus Christ, and I'll change your life. And some are even unwilling to take God at that very simple, simple promise. They don't want to do it. Hey, not just unbelievers, but God comes to you and I today, those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, and He says, look, I've got something that I desire for you to do uh, with your life. Hey, I want you, to, uh, I want you to reach that person over there, and, and, and I'll bless your life for it. I want you to obey me. I want you to trust me in this trial. I want you to believe me in this situation that's creating stress and tension, all kinds of problems. I want you to rest in me. But how willing are we to say, okay, Lord, I'm tired of carrying this load. I'm tired of bearing it. I'm placing it on you, and I'm trusting you. I'm giving it all to you. Just like Noah said, I believe God. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. Hey, it, it sounds irrational. It doesn't sound like, it doesn't make common sense. But Noah says, that's okay. God's commanded it. You go ahead and laugh. You laugh. You have a good old time. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do what God's told me to do. You know how small faith we have in measure to what Noah had. How small faith we have. Noah came to God by faith. Noah walked with God by faith. Noah continued with God and worked for God by faith. It staggers the imagination. He believed what God said would happen, happen. I think about how quick I run out of patience. Think about you. How quick we run out of patience with God. I don't know, how long does it last? A week? Does it even last that long? Does it even last that long? Noah stood for God for over 100 years, 120 years. Can you imagine the day when the raindrops started falling? Can you imagine? You know, when the sun was shining and everything looked beautiful outside, Noah looked like the biggest fool who walked the face of the earth. Who in his right mind would build such a thing on dry land, not near any body of water whatsoever? By the way, it's often been the case that men who took God at his word looked like a fool. It's often been the case. By the way, God may ask you to do something. He may ask you to live and and do something that seems absolutely irrational. But let me tell you something. It behooves me and it behooves you to obey God. You mark it down. The story is told of a man who wore a sandwich board sign, and on the front of that sign, it said this, I am a fool for Jesus Christ, and people laughed at him. On the back side, on his back, it asked this question, Whose fool are you? The truth of the matter is, everybody's someone's fool. 
Everybody. Listen, I'll be a fool for God and win in the end. I'll be a fool for God and win in the end. What was the ground of Noah's faith, by the way? Can I tell you what the ground of his faith was? It's very simple, what God had told him. The ground of his faith was the Word of God. What is to be the ground of my faith and your faith? The Word of God. Take God at what He says. He said, I believe that what God says is true. I'm going to obey that. I want you to look with me in the Gospels for just a minute. Look in the Gospel of Luke, if you would. Luke chapter 5. Here's a familiar story to us in Luke chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke in the 5th chapter. The Bible says it came to pass, verse 1 of Luke 5, that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. He comes to, to Peter's boat, and he says, Peter, Peter, can I use your boat? Is it all right if I use your boat, Peter? And Peter consents, and the Bible says, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Verse 5, and Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've told all the night and have taken nothing. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, I want you to know something, Jesus. We're the fishermen. We know this sea. We know where all the spots are. And by the way, just in case you didn't know, we've been out there all night. And we haven't taken a thing. And then he stops, if you notice, mid-verse. And notice what he does. He exercises little faith. Notice he says, Nevertheless at thy word I will let down the net. Jesus said nets, right? Over in verse 4. And he said, I'll let down a net. Okay, Jesus, just to... Just to placate you, just to satisfy you, I, 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 I'll, I'll put one net out there. And the Bible says in verse 6, And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. You know something? Even though Peter's faith was small, God honored his faith. God honored his faith. Noah obeyed back in Genesis chapter 6, even though he couldn't see. He did it, why? Because he believed what God had said. He believed God's word about judgment. He believed God's word about promise, both of those things. He obeyed God to the very letter. He took it all and he did it all. The Bible says twice that he did it there in verse number 22 of Genesis chapter 6. He didn't pick and choose his points of obedience. The Bible says he did it all, all that God had commanded. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, He who does not believe that God will punish sin will not believe that he will pardon it through atoning blood. Okay, what you, what, what's the point? The point is, here's the point. The point is that people want to believe God about promise, but they don't want to believe God about judgment. Oh yes, God is a good and gracious and loving and merciful God, and thank God for that, and he is. He is. But just because he has those attributes does not discount all of his other attributes. Matter of fact, because he is loving, just, merciful, and gracious, he also hates sin, and he will judge sin. He is also a God who will pour out his wrath upon sin. Mark it down. Spurgeon also went on to say this. He said, I charge you who profess the Lord not to be uh, uh, unbelieving with regard to the terrible threatenings of God to the ungodly. Believe the threat even though it should chill your blood. Believe though nature shrinks from the overwhelming doom. For if you do not believe, the act of disbelieving God at one point will drive you to disbelieve Him upon the other points of revealed truth. Noah believed God. He believed about promise. And he believed about judgment. He believed both. He said, I'm not only going to receive a promise, but the whole world is going to be destroyed. He believed God fully. The first thing, look, the first thing that testifies the genuineness of your faith is you respond in obedience to God's word. You respond in obedience to God's word. Let me give you the second thing. He rebuked the world. 
he rebuked the world. If you look back there in Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 7, the Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not as yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He believed what God said. He responded in obedience to the word of God. Now notice, by that, by his obedience, by the which he condemned the world. He was a man of faith in God. And because of that, he was different. He was different than the others around him. Do you know Noah was a preacher? He was a preacher of righteousness. By the way, what was his sermon? Look in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 with me for just a minute. 2 Peter chapter 2. What was Noah's sermon? 2 Peter 2 verse number 4. The Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and he did that right with the fall of Lucifer, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. They haven't gotten their final judgment, but they will. Verse 5, And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. What did he preach? The Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. What was his text? His text was simply this. For over a hundred years, his text was being faithful to build the boat that God told him to build. His text was his obedience. His text was just continually doing what God had told him to do because with every swing of that hammer, with every plank that he carried, with every bit of pitch that he put on that ark, you know what he was saying? He was screaming, Judgment is coming! Judgment is coming! That's what he was saying. Look, year after year after year after year, 10 years turned into 15, turned into 30, turned into 60. Don't you think they became a little indifferent after a while? First they just think, you know, I wish he'd be quiet. Then they think, I think he's off his rocker. And then they think, is he ever going to stop? And he just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. He preached with his life. Think about the fact that maybe Noah had other people help him build the ark. If he had other people help him build the ark, think about this. There were people who stood there and who drove nails into that wood and who put pitch onto that ark. They prepared the ark of safety, but they were never secured in the ark of safety. What a sad thing. Noah's life, by the way, was set in contrast to this wicked world. His, his life was a white, a white light of condemnation against the darkness of this world. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God looked down and said, Here's my verdict against this world. Uh, the fact of the matter is it is condemned, and that settles it. Uh, you know, human actions, we, uh, we can see with our physical eyes, we can see the evil human actions of this world, but only God can look in and see what's going on in the heart. And God passed the verdict. He said, I see the heart of men. Only God can write a sentence like Genesis 6, 5. And then it, it, a similar passage in Ezekiel eleven five. 5, God said this, I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Nothing's hidden from him of whom we have to do. He knows every thought. Every thought. He knows it all. By the way, God's not taken by surprise. He's not taken by surprise. He doesn't change his mind. You, you, you read there in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, it came to pass at the end of 40 days that, uh, uh, excuse me, in Genesis 6, verse number 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now wait a minute, it says, it repented the Lord... What does that mean? I thought, uh, I thought God didn't repent. I mean, I mean, 1 Samuel 15, 29 says, The strength of Israel, talking about God, will not lie nor repent. Why? For he is not a man that he should repent. Well, what is this? Here you have a statement about God in human terms. From a human standpoint, it seems as though God changed his mind. But the fact of the matter is that God did not change his mind. From God's eyes, nothing had changed. 
But it appeared from a human standpoint that God had changed his plans. We call it, here's a big word. This is a dollar word, maybe a five dollar word. An anthropomorphism. That's what we call that. It was only God's justice Not only that that was offended in verse number 6 for him to say such a thing, but notice as well, verse 7, his heart was grieved. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. His heart was grieved. I think about that. That's a terrible resolution. Terrible resolution. But God says, because of their sin, I'm coming in destruction. I'm coming in destruction upon that generation. Why? The Bible says in verse number 12, look in verse 12 of Genesis 6, all flesh, the end of the verse, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. God had a divine, he always does, he always has. He has a divine standard. You you obey that divine standard and you are what? blessed you break that divine standard and you go your own way the way of Cain you go your own way and you are what you are cursed you can mark it down that's what God says right here they had corrupted his way that means they did what they thought was right in their own eyes and they corrupted God's way the shortest definition of sin in the world someone has said is two words I will I will will. By the way, before you sit in judgment against God, before you impugn God, before you question God, remember that God gave them every chance and they went their own way. By the way, He does that for every last person. He gives them every chance. He says, like we talked about in the Sunday School Hour, come! Come, repent! Come to me! Look, no one will be able, not one person will be able to stand before a holy God and say, I didn't know, there was no way I could understand. No one can do that because he's provided the way. Say, preacher, how do you know that? Hey, in Genesis 3.15, he promised right there, he promised the first human beings on the face of the earth. He said, I'm going to send a redeemer. You have that wonderful promise I've given to you. You can rest secure in that promise. Obey me, follow me, and you have that promise is given to you. And then we find that Cain goes his own way and he stands as a testimony on the other side. The way of Cain, the one who turned his back on God. Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone, what? To his own way. To his own way. The world was rotten and God said, I'm going to judge it. Time and time again you find God telling people throughout the word of God that he was going to send judgment. By the way, if God doesn't act to destroy this sinful world that you and I live in, then we are without hope. We face an eternity of sinfulness because man cannot bring salvation. Man cannot bring peace. Let me tell you, there's great hope, there's great comfort, there's great joy in the coming of Jesus Christ in judgment. There's great hope in that. You know, I want... I want the world that Jesus Christ has promised. That's what I want. Don't you want that? I want that. God, therefore, is holy and just, and He cannot look upon sin. And by the way, I am grateful to God that through the person of Jesus Christ and His death on Calvary, thank God He's alive forevermore, and my sin is dead in Christ. It's already been taken care of. It's sealed under the blood. Don't ever think for a moment there isn't grace and mercy in the judgment of God. Don't ever think there's not. Barnhouse, the theologian, said this, Hell is as much a part of the love story of God as heaven is. But remember this, God's judgment is slow. His judgment is slow. He's very patient. He's very long-suffering. I want you to think about this great illustration. Think about Methuselah. Remember Methuselah, the oldest human being who ever lived? He lived how long? 969 years, right? He was the son of who? Enoch. He was the son of Enoch. Methuselah, we think of his name, we think about a long life. Do you know what his name means? His name means this. When he is dead, it shall be sent. Profound. Very profound, actually. When he is dead, it shall be sent. 
Enoch's wife gave birth to that boy, and uh, they came in, and uh, they say, we're going to name him Methuselah, and God says, I want you to look at that boy real hard, Enoch. I want you to look down into his eyes, because he is significant. He is very, very significant. You see that baby? As long as that baby lives, this world will endure. But when that baby dies, this world is finished. It's done. It's done. I want you to look in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 20. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 20. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. What was it waiting for? Methuselah to die. Waiting for Methuselah to die. While the ark was preparing, we're in few that his eight souls were saved by water. Does that tell you a little bit about the grace of God? Almost a thousand years God waits. Almost a thousand years He waits. When He's dead, it. What's the it? The flood. It's coming. It's coming. It will come. By the way, God knows when a man crosses the line. He knows. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 19. Stay with me now. We're, we're coming near the end. Romans chapter 1 verse number 19. Notice what the Bible says. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They're without excuse. By the way, before you get upset at God destroying the old world, before you latch out and attack the justice of God, look again, He was merciful for a thousand years practically. He was merciful. You know that every man is without excuse. The institution of the atoning sacrifice as the way to approach God was given. It was shown by Abel. They knew how to come to God. They knew how, uh, uh, how what would happen if they did not respond to God. The mark of Cain was a testament to that. The preaching of Enoch was a warning. The preaching of Noah was a warning. God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man in Genesis 6.3. They knew. They knew but they became hard and they rejected it. And Noah stands as a white testimony against the blackness of this world. Noah, by his faith, by his obedience to God, revealed, look, we say he rebuked this world. He rebuked them for their wickedness because he said, I will obey God. Do you know that you will naturally, you will naturally, you couldn't help it, you will naturally rebuke the sin of this world if you're obedient to God? It'll just be a natural thing. What were the characteristics? The Bible says that in Genesis or in Matthew 24, 37, that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. What were the characteristics of Noah's day? They laughed. They laughed at the preaching of the gospel. In Noah's day, there was a multiplication, there was a population explosion. You read Genesis 6 1 again, that's duplicated today. In Noah's day, God was dealing patiently with the sinful world. God's dealing patiently now. He's waiting. He's waiting. In God's day, uh, uh, God was striving with man. He's still striving with man today. Today is the day where the Spirit of God is working in patience. But the Bible says there's coming a day when the Spirit of God will be removed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In Noah's day, God's message was rejected. In Noah's day, there was a remnant who found grace. The same is true today. The same is true today. In Noah's day, Enoch was miraculously translated. Hey, that's a picture of you and I who know Jesus Christ as Savior at the rapture. We're going up. In the twinkling of an eye, God is coming in judgment. Not, look, not by water this time, but by fire. He's coming in judgment. We know that Noah had real faith. He responded to God's word. He rebuked the world in which he lived. Lastly, he received, he received God's righteousness. Let me ask you a question. Can you drum up your own righteousness? Can you do that? Oh, sure you can. But it only amount, the Bible says, to filthy rags and worthlessness. A lot of people drumming up their own righteousness. But there's only one way to enter into the presence of God, and that's through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Noah's the first man in the Bible to be called righteous. He was a just man. 
The only way you can become righteous is by faith. The Jews, they ran around trying to establish their own righteousness in the day of Christ, in the day of Paul. But as for the believer, for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ Himself, not because there's anything good in me, but I have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ placed to my account. Do you know how God looks at us? He doesn't look at us as who we are anymore. He sees every believer the same way, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Noah illustrates the life and the walk and the obedience of the work of faith in every way. He was an absolute model man of faith. You know what we need today? We need more men and women like Noah. My prayer is, God, help me to be like Noah. Help me to be like Noah. To really believe you. To obey you to the point that no matter how bizarre or how irrational it may seem or how difficult or out of my routine, I'll still obey you. I want that same faith that Noah had to believe God. I want my faith to stand as a testimony to this corrupt world, to rebuke this corrupt world. I want that type of faith which establishes the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to my account. Listen, friends, I want to tell you something. Just as Noah said, judgment is coming. Jesus is coming. I don't know that we have 120 years or not, but just as surely as the flood came, Jesus is coming. He's coming. And we have a responsibility. He's coming in judgment. You can believe it, or you can not believe it. By the way, it doesn't affect the truth either way. It's still true. Remember this, as Peter wrote, if God spared not the angels that sinned, if He spared not the old world in Noah's day, if He spared not, he goes on to say there in that passage, if He spared not Sodom and Gomorrah, but destroyed them, who are we to think that God would spare this world? Who are we to think that? The only security, the only refuge is found in Jesus Christ. There's no other refuge. There is no other refuge. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. There's only one way to come to that refuge, and that's by faith. You and I don't have anything to offer of ourselves. In ourselves, we're vanity, we're empty. We're vain. But may we pray, Lord, Help us to be people of faith in God. May we really believe you and live like it. Lord, may we order our lives like Noah ordered his life. May we do that which will make us ready, and not only us, but others to meet Jesus Christ. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. Help us to live in that judgment. God, help us to do it. Hey, look, it's good to believe God. He's proven himself faithful. He's proven himself worthy. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, don't wait. Do it today. If you're a Christian here, why don't you say, Lord, help me. Help my life. Help my life to be a testament of obedience, responding to you completely. Completely. Thus did Noah all that God commanded him to do. Thus he did, the Bible says in Genesis 6.22. Not one part missing. Help our lives to be a testament and rebuke this world so that we might receive the righteousness, be established in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Lord Jesus, do the work that you and you alone can do, I pray.